firing line with William F. Buckley, Jr. Tonight, a war on poverty. Hope or hopeless? But Michael Harrington, the young and engaging man from whom you're about to hear uh, and by whom I'm about to be whiplashed, but when Dr. Heller took the subject up with Mr. Kennedy's successor, Mr. Johnson reacted with enthusiasm. And so the war was born towards the prosecution of which we are spending about $2 billion a year. Not nearly enough to satisfy Mr. Harrington, I'm sure he will make clear, with that emotional conciseness for which he is greatly and justifiably famous. Mr. Harrington was, by the way, raised in St. Louis, went to college at Holy Cross and Yale, and took an advanced degree at the University of Chicago, greatly impressing students and faculty alike by his brilliance. Sometime after leaving college, he joined the staff of the Catholic Worker, having first taken, or so the story goes, a pledge of personal poverty. A mutual friend sometime later remarked to me that the foundations of the country are going broke, maintaining Michael Harrington in poverty. Uh, but no matter, he has hardly impoverished the social or polemical literature of America, and I welcome him to a discussion of the poverty program and to some of the general problems it raises. We'll be back in a moment with Mr. Harrington. Mr. Harrington, there seems to be uh, all kinds of definitions floating around about what poverty actually consists in, and you're supposed to be some kind of an authority on that subject. How, how do you define poverty for purposes of the poverty program? Well, it's not how I define it, it's how the government does. I'm more interested uh, in your definition. Okay, mine's government. the government's, because it's become very precise. Uh, the government usually does what you tell it, is that what you oh, mean? Oh, not at all, not at all. It hasn't done one-tenth of what uh, I would like it to do. But uh, after the president originally declared war on poverty, and after my book, which was fairly vague as to the precise character of poverty, a lot more work was done. Uh, and now we have a very good definition, I think. It says that the upper limit of poverty, the well-off poor, are a family in which the uh, four people living in a city, uh, in which the woman is presumed to be a good cook and shopper and can spend 22 cents per person per, per meal, or put another way, uh, can spend for the big meal of the day for all four members of the family 95 cents. That's the top. That meal, by the way, is a basic nutritional uh, meal uh, figured out by the Department of Agriculture. And the government's thesis, which I subscribe to, is that if you have an income under that necessary for this meal, uh, you will be choosing between necessities. You will have to have less than enough food in order to have decent housing or clothing or medicine. If, if you're making the point that people have to eat, I will concede it, uh, in order to live. But what disturbs me is that there are a number of professional students of the problem who raise, <coughs> raise uh, questions and points that in your copious literature on the subject you simply haven't disposed of very easily. By that um, $3,000 figure, for instance, that, that you rely on so, heaven, uh, so uh, heavily, over 50% of the United States was poor in 1929, and yet that is historically known as one of the exuberant years in American history. Isn't that correct? Don't you really go further and say that poverty is defined by the relative uh, <coughs> uh, scarcity of funds in the society in which you live. The people whom you call poor in the United States would be considered rich in India or Latin America, would they not? Well, first of all, let me clarify a fact, which is I don't use a 3,000 criterion, and neither does the government. Uh, we use a criterion of <coughs> $3,130 for an urban family of four. Well, there must have been inflation since I read no, this. No, no, uh, what's, it's not an inflation. It's that we have made much more precise and answered the objections, mm -hmm. which were in some cases validly raised, that we did not specify for family size, for people living in the country, et cetera. Secondly, there is a sense in which the poverty definition is relative, historically relative. <coughs> uh, to tell a poor person without enough food in Appalachia that he's better off than an Indian peasant is called comfort to him because he doesn't live in India, he lives in Appalachia. Well, that's what I'm, I'm trying to reach for. But in other words, uh, uh, to a considerable extent, the subjective uh, feelings of the person you're addressing are relevant. No, uh, sure, of course they're relevant. Yeah, yeah. But well, uh, well, don't say quite of course, because uh, some people think they are not relevant. No, but if you'll notice... Unless we des describe poverty as something a little bit different. The definition that I gave was one not predicated mm -hmm. on the subjective feelings of that Appalachian poor person, 
but predicated on the amount of nutritional material necessary given our standards for a most minimal diet, assuming, which is not at, uh, always the case, uh, that uh, they will use money in the most uh, precise and exact way to feed themselves. Hunger, lack of nutrition, loss of lifespan, uh, disease, these things are not relative. These things, a person who is hungry in Appalachia is as hungry or has the same experience as a person in India. Well, but you, I, th I thought a moment ago that you, you leaned rather heavily on an escape clause. You said that people are, are poor who, if they had to... Uh, if they had to reroute some of the money that would be spent on their nutrition to other, quotes necessities, uh, <clears throat> would be people who would fall under your program. Now, uh, going over the statistics, one sees that, for instance, 15% of the people who are officially classed as poor under this definition bought new cars the year before last. Now, would you say a new car is a necessity under this psychic definition? or under the more objective definition? Now, first of all, right. most of this new car uh, kind of old wives' tale that is uh, uh, tossed why, against why, the statistics. Why am I talking about an old wives' tale? I'm talking because the, the Because all of those definitions that you're quoting and all of these objections were urged mm. against the first definition, not the one that I'm using. Uh, that is to say, one has to study the literature and know what the government now says, not what it said two years ago. Secondly, it does happen to be the case that rural areas of the country for a poor farm worker or farmer, a car is indeed an absolute necessity because he doesn't have a bus or subway. But car, more basically, I think the real We're argument tarantine. between us, mm -hmm. the real argument between us is that in the 19th century, the conservative said to the tuberculosis-ridden, uh, immiserated British worker, think mm. of how better off you are than a medieval knight. And the real issue is not how better off than an Indian peasant an American poor person is, but how better off he could be if we lived up to our social responsibility. Well, but don't you think some, some people uh, believe that the problem is not uh, uh, one as regards what would be, what would ideally obtain. Uh, ideally, not only would there not be uh, any poverty here, there would be no poverty anywhere else in the world. And to that end, uh, we have from time to time committed ourselves uh, and uh, are at this moment engaged, for instance, in sending a billion dollars worth of grain to, to India. So I think that the people who criticize the poverty program uh, do so to some extent with reference to the resources of the society. And then, of course, it gets terribly confusing because, although you've been very well disciplined in your definition of poverty, uh, in fact, a lot of the literature on the poverty uh, problem describes not only ma ma material poverty, but a poverty of a completely different order. Uh, Paul Jacobs, whom, whom you know and admire, has written that the poor in America are not so much physical as psychological paupers. And the economist Henry Wallach has said poverty seems to be primarily a, a social condition. They're talking about loneliness, alienation, no, they're, and they're, all of those they're problems. Talking, again, they're talking about, uh, <clears throat> let me not speak for, for Paul Jacobs or Wallach, let me speak for myself. I do not talk simply of some uh, non-quantifiable thing called loneliness. I talk about the fact that the rate of psychosis and neurosis that is observed by the public authorities among poor people is two, three, four, and five times greater than among anyone else. Uh, and that far from the American myth uh, that those who suffer on estates in Connecticut have the terrible uh, pangs and <coughs> the torments of affluence, while the noble savage is in the slums, far from that myth. In fact, uh, the estate owners have uh, much less neurotic and psychotic lives than the poor people. That being kicked around and being pushed down and living in dense, miserable housing and dealing with cockroaches and rats uh, are not the kinds of things that make one a, uh, a balanced, a content, uh, normal and adjusted, healthy personality. Yes, and, and I, c I couldn't agree with you more, but I'm, I'm trying to raise the following uh, a problem. Uh, namely, to, to what extent is a poverty program that is materially designed to dissipate such difficulties as you have elaborated, to what extent can we count on it uh, to alle alleviate all of these concomitant uh, miseries? Paul Jacobs, for instance, uh, says that, that one of the things about poor people is, is that they don't receive letters, they don't receive mail, uh, and, and, and I think that he says so very poignantly i.e. that this, this, this is one of the great afflictions, especially in a, in a modern and hectic society, that when people are no longer useful, somehow they very often get dropped. But 
do you really think that the government, through a highly bureaucratized poverty government, can, can reach in and help a person of that kind? Or aren't you really, really stuck because what is at fault with this society is that an ethos of a kind that did make even very poor people happier than, than relatively rich people are today uh, made it possible for them to come to grips with their existence. Well, leave you, you, after all, do despise our social order. You don't believe there's such a thing as, as, as religion. And uh, under the circumstances, you are in your active polemical life doing very much that, in my judgment, has the effect of depriving people of some of the consolations and some of the truths that might make them more serene. Well, could I have a... There's so much that's been tossed at me, if I could have a, a second. First of all, put aside for a moment uh, whether the federal uh, poverty uh, program is highly bureaucratized, as you uh, characterize it, because I think that's a shibboleth. But leave that aside for the moment. 